From National 9 News, this is Nightline with Hugh Remington. Saddam backs down, but the West suspects a trick. A man and two women still missing after a yacht capsize. And Andrew Johns bows out of the finals, grateful just to walk. Good evening. Also tonight, some answers, but many more questions as a robot probes the heart of the Great Pyramid. Saddam Hussein has stepped back from the brink with the dramatic decision to let weapons inspectors return to Iraq. Baghdad says there is now no justification for the United States, with or without UN backing, to go to war against Iraq. But Prime Minister Howard and US President George Bush are openly sceptical. Robert Penfold reports. Round one to the United States. Its threats of invasion most likely forced Saddam Hussein to back down on his ban on weapons inspections. And the first indication of a change of heart came from the Iraqi foreign minister late in the afternoon in New York. We reached satisfactory results. Uh, that is good news. Uh... The breakthrough was soon revealed by a very relieved UN Secretary General. And I can confirm to you that I have received a letter from the Iraqi authorities conveying his decision to allow the return of the inspectors without conditions to continue their work. Still, America remains skeptical. From a senior U.S. official, we do not take what Saddam says at face value. And this from former chief U.N. weapons inspector Richard Butler, who is back home in Australia at the moment. Work without conditions means go anywhere, anytime, and look at whatever is required. I don't hear them saying that they will do that. Saddam's decision would have also been triggered by today's about face by the Saudis to allow warplanes use of its air bases if there was an attack. If the UN Security Council makes a decision on this matter, that Saudi Arabia, like all other members of the UN, would be obliged to go along with it. In fact, the war to break down Saddam has already started. Coalition forces, namely British and US fighter planes, have changed tactics in Iraq to enforce the no-fly zones. The aircraft have been regularly destroying Iraqi mobile missile sites and are now targeting more substantial command and control towers. They're the nerve centers of Saddam's air defenses. Despite today's commitment by Saddam, the Americans believe he's only stalling for time and once again will put up barriers once the inspectors arrive. In the United States, Robert Penvold reporting for Nightline. And back home, the Prime Minister has welcomed Saddam Hussein's move, but says we should not be naive. Echoing the reaction from America, Mr Howard says the Iraqi dictator's promises should not be taken at face value. The decision by Iraq to allow UN weapons inspectors back into the country was welcomed by both sides of Parliament. It is um, a cautious first step towards a solution of this very difficult issue. Uh, without um, resort to military conflict. It demonstrates what Labor has consistently said all along. The UN processes are the most effective mechanism for re resolving the standoff with Iraq. But the government was clearly sceptical, warning that Saddam Hussein could not be trusted. He's a past master of last minute manoeuvres to head off decisive action, and he's renowned for his unpredictability. The world would be deluded to naively imagine that this is the end of the difficulty. The fear is that the Iraqi leader is simply buying time. The international community won't accept further delays or obstruction of UN weapons inspectors and the Iraqi government should have no illusions about this. That resumed inspections must be unfettered and unconditional and lead to the complete and permanent disarmament of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Addressing Parliament on his return from the United Nations, Mr Downer said all of the key political figures he'd spoken to, including some from Arab countries, agreed the world could no longer ignore the threat posed by Iraq's chemical and biological weapons. They kill or incapacitate in horrendous ways. In the hands of malign or unpredictable leaders, they are weapons of terror. But the opposition says the government has still not made a strong enough case to go to war against Iraq if Saddam Hussein fails to honour his commitment to the UN. The government today, if for no other reason than that, should be looking for the additional evidence that's needed if we're going to send our sons and daughters off to war. Laurie Wilson reporting for Nightline. 
To other news now, and a search will resume at first light for a man and two women missing from a yacht that overturned when it lost its keel off the New South Wales mid-north coast. Two crewmen have been rescued. The body of a third has been found in the water, 42 nautical miles off Port Stephens. The yacht Excalibur was returning to Melbourne from a race. Rough weather has hindered the search. For the six crew aboard the Excalibur, strong winds and rough seas failed to muffle the strange sounds that came from the hull moments before the yacht's keel snapped off. We found ourselves, everybody was uh, completely underwater. I then uh, managed to find a knife, cut my lifeline and uh, found my way out. In darkness, John Rogers managed to scramble onto a life raft with fellow sailor Brian McDermott, a distress beacon helping to guide the bulk carrier Courier to their rescue six hours later. But with no sign of the other four crew members, a large-scale search began at first light. In atrocious weather conditions, ten aircraft and seven vessels scoured an area stretching over a thousand square kilometres. We hope that they're, they're out there. We know that they had life jackets on. Uh, we're, we're searching every possible area. By mid-morning, a life jacket was found less than a kilometre from the yacht. A short time later, rescuers discovered the body of one of the missing sailors. These people are all my close friends, as well as my sailing companions, so it's been a pretty tough sort of day. Alan Saunders, the yacht's owner, was on the vessel only last week. The Excalibur had been racing at Hamilton Island and was on her way home to Melbourne when she's thought to have hit something 43 nautical miles off Seal Rocks on the New South Wales mid-north coast. Along with the families and crewmates of the missing people, we are hoping and praying for their safe return. Strong winds and three metre waves are hampering efforts to tow the yacht to Port Stephens. The search for the two missing women and a man will resume at dawn, which is when the ship carrying the two survivors is expected to dock at Port Kembla. Anna Corrin reporting for Nightline. And two fishermen rescued at the weekend off Brisbane's Morton Island after drifting for 14 days in a life raft have told their story for the first time. Stephen Wong and Jack Heather were heading from the Gold Coast to Numea when their boat caught fire and sank. When finally rescued by a tuna boat, they were dehydrated and suffering hypothermia. The men, devout Christians, say when the provisions ran out, they simply prayed. We had like six lightning bolts go off right in our very faces and um, the water just came down right above us and we just laid there with our mouths open. A mutton bird came into our life raft with us and we were stroking it, patting it, and then it uh, regurgitated this brilliant lump of fish. The men claim several ships ignored them. Police say it's more likely they simply were not seen. The Australian Navy is to launch a major overhaul of safety after the death of a young sailor. Peter Harvey reports he disappeared overboard from HMAS Darwin. More than four months after 20-year-old leading seaman Cameron Gurr was lost overboard, there are still no definite answers. Alcohol was most likely a factor in leading seaman Gurr's loss. It also concluded that suicide probably was not a factor. In fact, the young, ambitious sailor had everything to live for, winning high praise for his work. On the night he vanished, he was celebrating another promotion, secretly drinking three beers and four shots of spirits, according to his mates. There is no doubt that rules were broken, but the price paid by leading Seaman Gurr, by his family and by the Navy, is far too high. Without publicly naming them, the report says some more senior naval personnel knew about the secret drinking that night and did nothing about it. Nine individuals are now under investigation and the inquiries called for some big changes. It wants better search and rescue gear on all warships, the issue of personal safety beacons to sailors, fitting alarms to all outside ship stores and hatches, and a crackdown on illegal alcohol on ships. The one measure that won't be introduced on Australian warships is prohibition. The Navy says its job is to encourage the responsible use of alcohol, not to ban it. Peter Harvey for Nightline.
The trial has begun in Perth of four Indonesians accused of smuggling the 434 asylum seekers who were rescued last year by the Tampa. It's claimed their small wooden fishing boat crammed with people tried to cross from Indonesia to Christmas Island but struck mechanical problems and heavy seas. The chief officer of the Tampa has formally identified the four. The jury has been urged to ignore the publicity surrounding the Tampa affair and concentrate on the evidence presented to the court. The four, including an 18-year-old, have pleaded not guilty to breaching the Migration Act. One of two British nuclear fuel ships carrying five tonnes of radioactive fuel for reprocessing has arrived in England amid tight security. Pacific Pintail was shadowed by a flotilla of anti-nuclear protesters with a fleet of police boats deployed to keep them at a distance. This was the ship that travelled up the east coast of Australia in July, attracting protest action involving New South Wales Greens MP Ian Cohen, who dived into its path, forcing the ship to take evasive action. Uh, Greenpeace, after their ridiculous antics in the Tasman Sea, have changed their tack and have said they wouldn't interfere with it. And I'm very pleased with that decision. The second vessel is due to dock later in the day. In what's being hailed as a landmark case involving the internet, the federal court has ordered an Adelaide man to remove material from his website that was found to be offensive and insulting to Jews. Holocaust revisionist Frederick Tobin says he will appeal the ruling in the interests of freedom of speech. It's 57 years since the end of the Second World War in Europe, but to this day, Frederick Tobin still insists the Holocaust never happened. When you reach a certain age, you, you want to say to anybody what you think. Despite all the documented evidence, Tobin, who was jailed in Germany in 1999 for distributing similar views, is unrepentant. Among the claims on his website called the Adelaide Institute, that it was unlikely homicidal gas chambers were at Auschwitz, and that Jews offended by Holocaust denial were of limited intelligence. So outraged was the Jewish community, it sought federal court action to get the remarks removed. The court today finding they breached the Racial Discrimination Act and could offend, insult, humiliate and intimidate Jews. The judgment, I think, is an historic victory for uh, the campaign against racism and a body blow against racists everywhere in Australia. The internet is part of society, not apart from society. Tobin now has seven days to remove the offending remarks from his website, but already he said he'll appeal the decision, arguing freedom of speech must be protected. You should, in a civilised way, be able to discuss, talk about anything. Nina Stevens reporting for Nightline. A man and a woman in their 20s are being questioned by police over a drive-by shooting at Reevesby in Sydney's southwest. Police spotted their car soon after the incident. At least two guns, including a revolver and a sawn-off rifle, have been recovered. There was no one in the house at the time of the shooting. While governments across Australia look for ways to reform public liability laws, it's not clear what they'd do with the case of a small country tourism operator being sued by a guest whose dog was bitten by a snake. The holidaymaker claimed damages, including for loss of enjoyment of his break. It's an idyllic getaway where rolling hills meet the ocean, a country escape where visitors can let their pets roam free. But when a guest's dog was bitten by a snake, they didn't blame Mother Nature, they went to court. And I was just horrified. It was just a shock <laughs> to think that it'd go that far. Jo Owen and her husband had come from Adelaide with their three golden retrievers. During their stay, one of the dogs dug up a snake. Everyone knows there are snakes in Australia and so we're, we're not saying it wasn't our fault but we didn't think that there would be any around the house. Despite that, the Owens decided to sue Joy Adams. They claim damages not only for the vet's fees but also their accommodation costs, the loss of holiday enjoyment and inconvenience. A total of more than $1,400. We need protection and we need the state government and people to say, look, this is gone too far. The claim ended up costing Joy $5,000 after her insurance company advised it would be more expensive to fight it. If worst comes to worst, tourism operators like Joy could be forced to ask guests to sign some kind of indemnity. Hardly a relaxing start to a holiday break. Fleur Bitcon for Nightline. 
A nine-year-old boy is alive and doing well after Sydney doctors gave him part of his father's liver. The 15-hour operation was the first so-called live liver transplant performed in Australia. Until last July, Mason Dixon was a perfectly healthy nine-year-old, but a rare viral liver infection put him in a coma within a week. In the end, it was basically, as the professor said, probably 48 hours. Mason needed a liver transplant, but no organs, traditionally taken from people who've died, were available. An international specialist recruited just this year to work at RPA Hospital came up with a procedure tried only once before in the world. Mason's diseased liver was left intact. A piece of Dad's healthy liver was cut off, driven to the Children's Hospital at Westmead and grafted onto Mason's to help it recuperate. Within four weeks, Dad's liver had completely regenerated and within a year or so, Mason's is expected to do the same without the need for lifelong medication. He has an extremely good outlook and a much better outlook than with a complete transplant. It's just amazing. It's a miracle. Mason, however, is more interested in his scar. I got 32 staples and I got three taken out and put some three stitches in. This new procedure now offers a viable alternative to the current problem of a shortage of donor organs. Currently, 30% of people die on those waiting lists, but now live donor transplants could change that. Cheryl Taylor for Nightline. Widespread rain has brought relief to New South Wales farmers, but it has not been enough to break the drought. Areas around Orange received more than 32 millimetres, while Young recorded nearly 50 millimetres in the past 24 hours. Not drought breaking yet, but it's, at least we know it can rain. Canola and cereal crops will benefit around Wagga Wagga, but it will take more showers in the next two to three weeks to guarantee a harvest. Rugby League's top player, Andrew Johns, has admitted he has a new perspective on life as he recovers from his season-ending back injury. Suddenly, football is not everything. Johns saying he's happy just to be walking again. With every small step, the pain was intense for Johns. Released from hospital just this morning, the Newcastle leader headed straight to training to offer whatever he could. I've just sort of got off the morphine uh, this morning, so uh, just on the, the sort of the tablets now to stop the pain, but um, yeah, still very uncomfortable. At this stage, John says he really isn't thinking about playing again this year. Three fractures in his lower back, courtesy of what was ruled an accidental kneeing by the Dragons' Luke Bailey, has had plenty of impact. If you sort of sit back and think, you know, I've broken a bone in my back, it's pretty serious. And, um, you know, I've had time to reflect on it, it's, you know, it's probably, it's really shaking me up a bit. Now the Premiership roughies, the Knights would love to win it for their injured general. Yeah, you know, i just sort of just be there and I suppose be a back slapper and hand out some water at half time, but, uh... And that's a lot better than doing it full time. Clinton Fletcher for Nightline. Now to finance news. An investor's welcomed the breakthrough in the Iraq crisis, pushing the All Ordinaries up 1%. AMP recovered from its record lows, adding 37 cents. David Jones rose 2 cents on increased sales figures, despite a 77% drop in annual profits, with News Corp back over $10 after putting on 39 cents. Shares falling included BRL Hardy, 15 cents lower. Newcrest Mining was down close to 10% as gold stocks fell across the board, with Woodside losing 24 cents to $13. 18. On overseas markets, Tokyo gained more than 300 points. London is trading 65 points higher. Gold is down, fetching $316.25 US an ounce. The Aussie dollar tonight is buying 54.6 US cents, 56 euro cents, 67 yen and 35 pence. Ahead on Nightline, the plan to soften the blow for planes that fall to earth. And the daredevils walking the walk above the Great Wall. He's the suspect. Anything you wanted to tell me. In a deadly game. Any urges? Young Lions at the new time, 9.30 tonight. Let him go. But he did it. Prove it. Catching this killer will mean putting lives at risk. Hey, what have we got? But Detective Smart never expected this. I know him. Now her nightmare begins. Five minutes he wanted. Five minutes of my life for all of his. Young Lions. Now at the new time, 9.30 tonight on 9. The new, more powerful 1.8-litre Mazda.
the 323 Astina and Protégé. From only 19990 with air, you won't be able to restrain yourself. See you in a few weeks. See ya. My very own restaurant, a crazy waiter, and menus to prepare. I'm Amy Perry and this is my day. What about William and Harry's daring plan to escape the palace and become playboys? Ooh, look what those naughty friends got up to at their wild private party. <gasps> What's happened to Nicole's hair? Oh, I love all the food, fashion and decorating ideas. And I could win a cleaner for a year. What a great day. It's your day. A woman's day. The news is out. New Pedigree Meaty Bites now has delicious, moist, meaty chunks to help keep your dog healthy, active and enjoying life. Win a $5,000 party at Banner's birthday celebration. This Sony 51cm TV, only $548. Save $100 off this sharp camcorder, just $748. Best price, best service, guaranteed. This is Nightline. Authorities in Singapore have arrested 21 suspected terrorists, claiming some of them trained with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, alleged September 11 plotter Ramsey Banalship has been handed over to American authorities after being arrested last week after a gun battle in Pakistan. He thought he could hide. He thought he could still threaten America. But he forgot the greatest nation on the face of the earth is after him. Benal Shib has been taken to an unknown location in the U.S. Meanwhile, the FBI has arrested another al-Qaeda suspect. Mokhtar al-Bakri is accused of being part of a terrorist cell living in a Yemeni community in New York State. It was a day of great excitement for archaeologists in Egypt as they sent a robot scuttling up a narrow tunnel in the middle of the Great Pyramid at Giza. The robot drilled through a stone door, pushing through a tiny camera to find... More of the same. This is incredibly exciting. What are we seeing, Zahi? We, we can see another sealed door. They've also lifted the lid on a coffin which dates back 45 centuries. I'm seeing this man is resting beautifully. The team will analyze what it's found before deciding its next move. Michelangelo's most famous work is getting a touch-up at its home in Florence. This seven-month restoration project on the statue of David aims to bring it back to peak condition. Carved from a single piece of marble when Michelangelo was just 28 years old, David is showing the signs of 500 years of wear and tear and the attentions of dozens of vandals. The European soccer champions Real Madrid have had a private audience with the Pope. After he blessed the team, the pontiff told them they should use their positions as famous footballers to promote Christianity. John Paul says sport is an instrument of education, imbuing young people with Christian values such as loyalty, perseverance and friendship. And a pair of thrill-seekers has gone for a stroll above the Great Wall of China. The tightrope walkers were more than 100 metres above the landmark, the safety net only there to protect their audience. They each walked a distance of precisely 2,008 metres to signify the year China is hosting the Olympic Games. As an idea, this one's been around for a while. If skydivers can be saved by their parachutes, why not apply the same principle for the entire plane? In America, work has begun. It's something you'd expect James Bond to have, a four-seater plane that's fitted with its own parachute. But Jan Logan is no secret agent. Flying for only five years, she's just become the proud owner of this Cirrus aircraft, only the fourth in the country, with its specialised chute, a welcome safety net. I've heard of situations where I thought if they'd had a parachute, they could have pulled it and got out safely. Designed in America, another dozen are on order as Australian pilots realise the difference the manually operated chute can make. 
in most circumstances where a pilot has got the time to activate the parachute, um, yes, it would, would uh, save their lives and their passengers. Using the parachute is really a one-off event. When it's released, a rocket rips through this section of the plane, pulling the parachute with it, causing a significant amount of damage to the aircraft. And then there's the landing. It's uh, equivalent to jumping off a six-foot fence, so it's not gentle. It's something Jan's prepared to withstand. At least it's there if we did need it. OK, I understand it's a pretty hard landing, but any landing that you can walk away from is a safe landing. Melissa Downs for Nightline. Sports news after the break, including a surprise new skipper for the Knights. And the Opals continue their unbeaten run. Cheap petrol. $600 a year, big side. Where to fill up and save, wherever you are. Fill up when you think that they're at their lowest price. Plus, boy or girl, selecting your dream baby. Everything they told me was absolutely precise. A current affair tonight, 6.30. Until last week, he was too embarrassed to discuss his erection problems. Now, he's in no mood to talk. Like millions of men, he has benefited from treatment. Erection problems are common. Talk to your doctor. I would. Is there an easy way to get better results from your dishwasher? Today, Brand Power shows you there is with Finish Powerball 3-in-1 tablets. They're dishwasher tablets with a Powerball that's a measured dose of Finish Rinse Aid. How do they work? First, pre-soakers and detergents remove all dried on food and residues. Then the Powerball releases Rinse Aid for a final sparkling clean shine. Try Finish Powerball 3-in-1 with Rinse Aid to see the difference for yourself. Brand Power, helping you buy better. Experience with your friends. The Nokia 7650, a phone with a digital camera. Red Hot Chili Peppers are heading back to Australia with special guest Papa Roach on their first ever visit. Don't miss Red Hot Chili Peppers and Papa Roach now in a second show. Get your tickets now. Now you can drive a genuine Formula Ford race car in full race trim at Queensland Raceway. For information on weekly schools, corporate days or gift vouchers, call you drive. Tonight on the clouds. Nothing certain. This is yours, by the way. That's not tough. You're definitely over, Alex. Two life-changing moments. If I can't trust you, then what future do we have? McLeod's Daughters, tonight on Nine. To sport now, and Matt Parsons will captain Newcastle in the absence of Andrew Johns for Sunday's sudden death final against the Roosters. But Knights coach Michael Hagan says to win, the whole team must share the load. As if the skies weren't dark enough around Newcastle. Today on their home ground, the Knights did their best to welcome their old skipper and their new. Circumstances aren't ideal to be doing it, obviously, but someone had to do it, so I think Hague's opted for me, and it's a great honour to be the captain this way, that's for sure. Big Matt Parsons intends to lead by example, but replacing the Johns factor is going to take some effort. A few other players need to take some responsibility too, like Danny Badiris and Kirk Gidley and Sean Rudder, so uh, between them I think we can get the job done. John's replacement for the knockout game against the Roosters is certainly a travelling man. Johnny Morris has covered nearly every position for the Knights this year and can't wait to start at halfback. I've still got five internationals in the side and they'll be making my job a lot easier, so... Um, no, I'm looking forward to the challenge. I think it'll be a good one. In a grand final tight build-up, the Roosters will complete their preparations in private. Today was their final open session, and they have as much to lose as Newcastle. You know, if we lose you know, and get knocked out this weekend, no one's going to care about how we've been going. So it's, uh, it's a good challenge if we can keep, keep it all the way to the end, but uh, you know, we haven't won anything yet. The Roosters have also suffered a setback. Adrian Morley will miss the game after pleading guilty to tripping. Clinton Fletcher for Nightline. 
In AFL, Essendon defender Mark Bolton will have a delayed start to next season, suspended for three matches for rough play in last Friday's match against Port Adelaide. Meanwhile, Port defender Damien Hardwick was the biggest loser as six players were fined a total of almost $25,000 for an on-field brawl. Hardwick was slugged $8,000. Essendon skipper James Hurd fined $5,000. Meanwhile, a taxing time for the coaches of the four clubs in this weekend's finals as they finalise their teams. Anthony Mithin has those details. Sticking rigidly to the routine that's worked for them all year, the Pies had a session to recover from a match they didn't have to play on the weekend. But while all Collingwood minds are focused on Adelaide, there's one Pie who can't help but spare a thought for selection news at Port. Shane Wakeland hoping for a change of luck for brother Darrell. I think it's just rewards uh, considering what he's gone through over the last four weeks and considering he's had a very good year so. The power defender was today cleared by medical staff and looks certain to play against Brisbane. Well the medical staff have cleared Daryl to resume uh, you know full contact training and he's been progressing to that anyway and uh, certainly he's, he's okay to play this weekend so it's back to the match committee now. The incident which broke Wakeland's cheekbone cost Crow Mark Bickley five weeks. Ironically he could be back for a grand final against Port and Fremantle has convinced another star to sign on. Following Matthew Pavlich's commitment Justin Longmuir today refused Carlton's overtures and put pen to paper. And I've signed for the same reason as Pav's signed and, um, and that's because we've got an exciting future. We've got a young group and um, we all want to be a part of the first successful Fremantle side. Anthony Mithin for Nightline. Australia is another step closer to a final showdown with the United States at the Women's World Basketball Championship. In the latest game, the Opals crushed Japan by 45 points to remain undefeated after three games. It soon became evident the only thing in question for the Opals would be the final winning margin. At every quarter, they increased their lead. Height advantage played a significant part in the Opals' dominance. Vice-captain Trish Fallon was rested because of an injury, while Lauren Jackson was cotton-wooled, playing just 13 and a half minutes. She still managed to top score with 25 points. After the preliminary rounds, Australia has finished on top of their pool and will face Yugoslavia tomorrow night. Tennis chit-chat between Leighton Hewitt and India's Leander Pays. A player the Aussies feel could cause them a problem in Friday's Davis Cup relegation tie in Adelaide. If it's a packed house and he's playing Leighton Hewitt, that's right up his alley. That's where you'll see the best of him. Despite a hectic schedule, the world number one makes the Davis Cup a priority, when many don't. If you look at guys in the top 10 or 20 in the world, not all of them would do this. Wayne Arthurs will play the singles along with Hewitt, who is also expected to partner Todd Woodbridge in the doubles. Ken Sutcliffe for Nightline. A freak own goal in English Premier League soccer has left Aston Villa's goalkeeper with a horror to live down. Peter Enkelman from Finland failed utterly to control a ball from a throw-in and suffered the ultimate embarrassment. One of the craziest goals ever! Enkelman miscontrolled a simple back pass. The kind of Birmingham went on to win the match 3-0. Next, the national weather details. In a blast from the past, the relics of Star Wars land in Australia. Thursday, get away to one of the most awesome places on Earth. Spectacularly big, wide, clean and green. Where the adventurous heart sings. Zippity doo da, zippity a. The sensitive soul soars. Around every corner, another heartbreaker vista. Adrenaline addicts go wild. I'm gonna shake go. <laughs> And exhilaration is the dish of the day. Get to Canada, this is a hell of a meal. Get away to Canada, 7.30 Thursday on 9. So, Nick, what's it all about? It's about a day in the life of two people. He's a regular Brisbane guy. She's a European backpacker heading home. He has 24 hours to win her heart. It's got a classic storyline. It's funny. It's got moments of high drama. It's got those contemplation bits. It's got people from all parts of the world. It's got dragons. It's got forests. It's a game of chance, and he's playing to win. How does it end? Does it have to end? The news is out. New Pedigree Meaty Bites now has delicious, moist, meaty chunks to help keep your dog healthy, active and enjoying life. 
If you don't feel 100%, maybe you're not getting all the fresh food you need for a healthy diet. Centrum, vitamin and mineral supplement can help. It's even used by the Australian Institute of Sport. Centrum, and new Centrum for kids. Complete from A to Zinc. Do you feel 100%? Why compromise to work from home? Canon professional scanners and printers deliver photo lab quality colour and breathtaking A4 prints. Know how to cut timber properly? Make sure you use a sharp saw, but be careful. Who makes buying home entertainment and computers easy? Clive Peters. Because Clive Peters has the largest choice of TVs, VCRs, DVD players, digital cameras, hi-fi, home theatre and computers. It's even easy to try all these products before you buy. Our staff are always happy to demonstrate. And don't worry if you're not an expert on modern technology, because we are. With over 30 years' experience and national buying power, we offer incredible value every day. At Clive Peters, it's so easy. Clive Peters, e -e easy Star Wars fans are in for a feast in Sydney over the next few months. A new exhibition, never before seen outside America, lays out all the original props and costumes. Everything from Jedi's to Jabba the Hutt's. Hello, I am C-3PO, Human Cyborg Relations, and this is my counterpart, R2-D2. Yeah. Actor Anthony Daniels first squeezed into that gold robot suit 27 years ago, admitting he didn't want the role at first. He thought the film would bomb. I wasn't into science fiction. I'd asked for my money back when I saw 2001 all those years before. I mean, what did I know? The exhibit continues at Sydney's Powerhouse Museum until February. The national weather now and a trough that brought rain to areas of eastern Australia is now moving offshore. Much of the continent influenced by a high centred near the Bight. A cold front is moving into the southeast. The forecasts: showers clearing in Darwin, fine in Brisbane, fine and windy in Sydney. The chance of showers in Canberra, showers in Melbourne, Hobart and Adelaide. A fine day is expected in Perth. And that was the day. I'm Hugh Rimmington from all of us here at Nightline. Good night. This program is proudly brought to you by the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Shell. Friday Night at the Movies, a story of decadence, greed and forbidden love. Starring Rufus Sewell and Australia's Naomi Watts. But I love you. At the special time, Dangerous Beauty premieres 9 o'clock Friday on 9.